Welcome to this conversation on undergraduate advising between our Chancellor Carol Christ and Susan Hagstrom, who's the Director of Undergraduate Advising in the Col College of Environmental Design. Um, I don't have to tell any of you out there that advising is a central piece of the undergraduate experience. It's one we've been focusing on over the last several years in trying to um, improve the landscape. And Carol, of course, knows this area well. She's advised on many levels in, in the academic um, uh, community. She's been a faculty member, chair in the English department here, former dean of the Division of Humanities, former provost of the College of Letters and Science and our first EVCP. And, um, and then went off and, and spent 11 years as president of Smith College. And believe me, when you're a liberal arts college president, you spend a lot of time directly with students. So her experience in that sense is, is vast and um, probably different than what many of our former chancellors have experienced. But Carol brings a special touch that way. Um, I think our chancellor and we all are committed to fostering a vibrant experience for our students. And we know that really excellent advising is a critical part of their journey. Before we begin with a conversation between Susan and Carol, I wanna to say to all of you advisors, thank you for your dedication and commitment in support of our undergraduates. And our goal today is to give you an opportunity to both hear from, from Carol and, and to have some interaction around um, this incredibly valuable part of the undergraduate experience. So thank you and thank you, Carol and Susan. Thank you, Kathleen. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to start by echoing Kathy's sentiment and thanking all of you for what you do for students every day. I know that it's challenging. We have this budget situation, enrollment growth, new technology, changes in our jobs every day. And still I know from experience that you come fully committed to helping students and to creating a student experience that's deep and meaningful for them. So thank you all. And I also wanted to start by thanking my generous thought partners who I spoke with in advance before uh, today to help prepare these questions. So in particular, Elizabeth Wilcox, Sarita Alexander, Jenny Kwan, Marissa Reynoso, Andrew Epic, Yuki Burton, Bob Jacobson, all of these people really helped me synthesize the things that I've been thinking about. So thanks to them. And Chancellor Chris, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. I think we're really thrilled to have this conversation. And um, I believe we will be learning from you. I hope we can share some things uh, that maybe you didn't know. I learned some things preparing for today. And maybe we can brainstorm some possible solutions to some of these tricky problems that we face. And you'll see that as I, I, I only have six questions, but there's so, I feel like they're very meaty. And uh, I'm going to be giving a little bit of context ahead of some of the questions. So just to give you an idea of what, what the flow might feel like. And before we dive into those questions, is there anything that you would like to say? I'd love to start off by saying a few things. First of all, I want to echo Kathy's and Susan's thanks. Uh, you are so important to our students. Advising is a critical part of the student experience as you help students chart their course through what is a pretty complicated and sometimes daunting institution. So I want to thank you for all your wonderful work with our students. And to say that I think advising is um, one of the most essential parts of the student experience, um, thinking about this program today gave me the opportunity uh, to uh, think about uh, advising in my career. Uh, the first question was supposed to be, uh, Susan's first question, could you reflect on your experiences as an undergraduate student on advising? And I wrote back to Susan, I couldn't do that because I couldn't remember a single one. But, um, <laughs> which I, I, I guess is, I mean, I'm sure I had those experiences, but I guess that's in part what advising is about is that it, it charts a course, but it is somewhat, I think, in retrospect, somewhat in, invisible, or at least it was to me. Advising has changed a lot for faculty members in my time at Berkeley. I, I began at Berkeley as a faculty member in 1970. Every faculty member in my department did advising. It was considered to be part of what you did. And I uh, remember 
uh, my experience of advising as being a combination of enormous frustration at all the technical questions that students asked me that I didn't know the answers to, um, together with really meaningful conversations about their intellectual course through Berkeley. Then my next experience uh, with advising that was really significant to me were the 11 years that I was president of Smith. At Smith, like Berkeley in the early days, every single faculty member advised students. And every faculty member was given a group of eight students, um, uh, uh, eight freshmen, and carried those eight freshmen with them into their sophomore year, eight sophomores. So every faculty member had this portfolio in addition to their major advisees of 16 students. Because I was president, they let me have half a portfolio, so I had four and four. <laughs> And um, the, some of the things we did that I really learned from are, first of all, we did a lot of group advising. We brought students in in groups and had the students talk about both their questions and also their, their goals. We also had students come prepared to advising appointments with um, a questionnaire we would ask them to fill out, really deliberative, interesting um, answers like, what do you want to get out of this year at Smith? Where do you think your strengths are? Where are your weaknesses? And that was a platform for what was a really, I think, richly rewarding conversation and led to a more deliberate um, a deliberate posture on the part of our students in relationship to their education. Um, we had at Smith lots of safety nets. Uh, if a student didn't come to class for a second class in a row, the dean's office found out. So we caught students early on when they started to get into trouble. Now I realize this is much easier when it's a small community and there's a student faculty ratio of um, 10 to one and not 26 to one as there is here. But I think it's so important to think about those best practices in advising and figure out which ones will scale, which ones can we use technology to help us achieve because I think advising is just critical, particularly when we have a student body as Smith certainly did, with students with very different levels of preparation for the college experience. So uh, advising for me is a very high priority and I wanna partner with you in trying to figure out how we can make our advising even better for our students than it currently is. Obviously we have lots of uh, challenges that we face, increasing enrollment, understaffing in the area of advising, but I think we need to think smart and figure out whether there are technological um, uh, tools that we can use, whether we can use groups. One of your questions later is gonna be about neighborhoods, whether we can use neighborhoods, so that we can make sure that every student gets the advising that he or she needs at the point that he or she needs it. Thank you. It's so. Um... It's so reassuring to hear your commitment and to thinking about many different ways that we can yeah. um, advise students and support students. So I'm really happy to hear all of that. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I wanted to provide, before my first question, I wanted to provide some information about the job, our job family, which surprised me. I wasn't even really aware. We have the largest job family on campus, student services, 931 staff are in the student services wow. family. It's huge. Yeah, it and huge. We're, we're a combination of curricular and co-curricular advisors. It's pretty evenly split. Um, we're residence hall staff, career counselors, EOP counselors, academic advisors. We help with financial aid, DSP. We're really throughout the campus. And pay within the job family is low for the Bay Area, 55 to $65,000 which is challenging here with housing costs and the cost of living. Uh, expectations, educational expectations are steep. We, uh, for most jobs now, the entry level positions either require or desire a master's degree. And many in our, in our field are Berkeley alum and many are themselves first generation college students. So uh, a really, um, we have a very robust community, I would say. 
And as a profession, we're deeply impacted by the same kinds of challenges that impact the college as a, the university as a whole. We face high caseloads, challenges with students' access to classes, classroom space shortages, more and more monitoring of students, students impacted by housing shortage and basic needs. Earlier you said some institutions are hiring social workers as their advisors, and I think we understand that. Um, Marissa Reynoso, who's a director in the LEAD Center, said that students have traditionally come to her to talk about uh, leadership opportunities or um, student groups, but now more and more they're coming to talk about access to classes or finding funding or space for their student organizations. So all of that is background for this question, mm -hmm. which is how do you think we might effectively approach some of these challenges, many of which are due to increasing enrollment, and is there anything in particular that we as the student services community could do to help with this? That's really a great question. And I think one of the, you, you know, I, as this audience knows just as well as I, students don't partition their question into the professional category that they think you fall into. So if they're going to the lead center, but they're really, really frustrated by not being able to get into the classes for their major, they're gonna ask that question of you, or they're gonna ask it at the athletic study center. So one of the things that I think is the most important is building a professional community of advisors on campus in which you do a lot of networking together. So nobody expects every advisor to have answers to all the questions. I mean, each of us has answers probably to a fairly narrow band of questions, but being networked in a way that, you know, if somebody comes to your office and you ask a question you don't know the answer to, you say, well, I don't know, but let me shoot an email to this person. They're gonna know the answer to this question. So I think that the kind of, you know, regarding yourself, which you are, a really important, fundamental, foundational professional group on this campus, and then doing the most you can with um, uh, opportunities for professional development that are also opportunities for networking, I think are one of the things that you can, um, that you can do. One of the things to do is really up to us, which is to put more resources into advising. I know Bob is really committed to that, Bob Jacobson. Um, and I know that your college, CED, has, has done that, has created all college advising. But raising the profile of advising to our faculty members, where our faculty members, because advising is often not part of the portfolio of things they do, I think are less conscious of all of the um, uh, needs our students have. So raising the profile of advising to our faculty, I think, is also important. Yes. And uh, just a follow-up question about the enrollment. Do you anticipate that enrollment is going to continue growing? I was thinking when, back in the 90s, we were at about 30,000, and now we're at 40,000. Mm -hmm. And I'm, do you think that this is a trend that's going to continue? Or? I think we have um, been very emphatic that we didn't want more students this year than we had last year. But the pressure on the UC system to increase enrollment is going to continue. I, the reasons are very simple. Um, the population of the state of California is growing despite sensational articles about California flight in the newspapers, it actually is growing. And even more important, graduation rates from high school are increasing and the UCs are becoming more and more attractive. So most campuses saw jumps in their yield rates this year. Mm -hmm. Indeed, some of the other campuses, I'm very proud to say Berkeley is not over-enrolled for the fall, mm -hmm. but a number of the other campuses are very, very significantly over-enrolled um, for next year. And uh, so I, I, I don't see and when the conversation with the legislature every year is about how many more students we would like you to take. Um, so I've spent a fair amount of time in Sacramento this past semester. Um, spending at least one day there a month talking with legislatures, making the case for more funding for increased enrollment, but the pressure to increase enrollment is not going to go away. Thank you. We talked about this a little bit earlier. Uh, I have a 
a question that relates to transactional versus transformational mm -hmm. advising. And again, a little bit of background information about how advising roles are constructed. Mm -hmm. So many were originally set up as a transactional role. And I think I, I heard when I started advising that before we had advising offices, advising was a window in Sproul Hall. Yeah. So I think I that's, that. that's kind of the history of where yeah. it started. And now, at least within the academic settings, I think we, we are bearing more and more transactional duties as part of our job. So we're advisor and room, uh, room scheduler, advisor and key, holder, you know, people who are responsible for the keys, or advisor and waitlist manager, or increasingly advisor and fundraiser. And our, our educational expertise is often in student development. We support students in making decisions about their personal life, their careers, their academic life. We can help them navigate difficult situations. We help them find a sense of meaning and belonging. And I, I was talking to Bob about this yesterday that there's so much more that we could do. We have so much expertise and passion for students, but I think we feel many of us burdened by these transactional um, tasks. And I know for myself that I'm spending more and more time running reports, placing blocks, releasing blocks, looking up codes, what they mean, trying to find information in the system, trying to find students in the system. And so what that's resulted in is less time for these deeper conversations with students, less time for creative mm -hmm. projects, less time to step back and think strategically about the services that we do offer. And sometimes I hear advisors say, this is not why I came to be an advisor. So my, my question is, what are your thoughts about the increasingly transactional nature of advising at Berkeley? And are there ways that we can raise the importance of professional advising with deans and chairs? You, you mentioned that earlier to possibly reconsider how advisors' time is used? Well, that's a, a really great question. I, first of all, I have to say that uh, tra any kind of transition to new information systems is full of frustration. And uh, at the same time the campus has been experiencing this, these increases in enrollment, we've been trans uh, transitioning to CIS. It's been a rocky transition, I know. And that just means that there is an awful lot of time tr uh, spent trying to figure out how to use the system. I think it's really critical to use that system as efficiently as possible so that we let automation do as many things as it can do for you and for our students. Uh, I also think we should look to other universities who may be doing a really good job with uh, automation in relationship to advising. I've heard Arizona State does some pretty incredible things um, with automation. Um, in order to free advisors' times for those more meaningful conversations. I also have become aware that we don't use student workers as much as we might use them and wonder if we're using peer advisors as fully as we might use them. I, I remember when I was here in the 90s, there was a booth on Sproul Plaza that it was LNS peer advisors ask me an advising question. And so trying to do as much as we can with other kinds of resources to free up your time as professionals with advanced degrees to do the more meaningful kinds of advising. And part of this, this would be really worth, there's a new chairs forum, and it really be, would be worth bringing the issue of how advisors spend their time to those chairs forum. We've been facing this issue in a completely different area of the campus, which is our fundraising officers. And we had a consultant come in and look at how well they were being used. And one of the things that the um, consultants discovered is that they were spending often up to 50% of their time doing things other than fundraising, like writing reports or you know all these various transactional work that is important in any school or college or department. Department. So trying to, for the chairs, thinking through how they're best using their professional advisors and making sure that the more transactional um, uh, kind of lower level clerical tasks are being done by other people mm -hmm. or by students. Yes, and I've heard ideas about stratifying these positions yes. and 
Mm -hmm. Maybe some people that are really focused in on social media, some people that are focused on the fundraising, some are FaceTime mm -hmm. um, that we could somehow sort and, and let people who are really good at social media do that task and yes. instead of all of us trying to learn everything. Yeah, I think that that's a good idea. And that, that relates to this next question in a way, which is about advisor career development and retention. Mm -hmm. So retention of advising is an ongoing issue. Again, there's these high educational backgrounds and expectations, heavy and sometimes stressful workloads, non-competitive salaries, short career trajectory, and poor mobility within the job family. And I have to give a shout out to Elizabeth Wilcox, who's done so much for, uh, for us as a community and really energizing, uplifting, and unifying mm -hmm. this, this cohort. So, um, so in spite of all that she has done and many others have done, we are still seeing this constant exodus of highly talented professionals. Some feel trapped by this lateral career opportunity situation. Some are disheartened by the increasing transactional duties. Some are seeking higher pay and more flexible work environments, which uh, seem to be available at community colleges. We have a lot of people going to community colleges. And um, we've, we, I've heard ideas about ramping up central support for what Elizabeth has started and maybe having a team that's providing that kind of support for us. So my question, what recommendations do you have for the campus to retain and grow professional advising staff? Well, I think first of all, it's really important to create career ladders within the institution. Um, I think it's so valuable when um, uh, uh, staff members move from job to job within the institution, you get a much greater um, knowledge base, breadth of experience. Um, so I think that's important. I have so many of the people that I know in administrative positions, if you ask them, what are the other jobs you've done at Cal, often um, have an advising job in their, in their, um, in the, their background. I think having, a, I, I imagine this as building on Elizabeth Wilcox's work, having a ladder in advising is a good idea uh, so that there is a career trajectory within um, student services for advisors. But I also think it's important to have, um, have career ladders that include advising but, um, but may lead to jobs with, with other kinds of skill sets as well. But I, I, I think we lose when we don't retain our, our, our incredibly talented staff mm -hmm. members and we have to be very deliberate about our HR programs in order to do that. Yes, thank you. Yes, I see, I mean, I'm always happy when our staff Staff that I supervise get jobs other places in UC, but then when they leave UC, it's, it's, yeah. I feel like it's a big loss for the university. Yeah, it is. So, uh, so this next question is my favorite. I'm really excited to talk about this, and that's the idea of advising neighborhoods. And I understand that you have a vision of UC Berkeley as a city that's built of smaller neighborhoods that serve as homes and spaces of belonging for students. Mm -hmm. And I know uh, E&I and Student Affairs are good at supporting student neighborhoods and communities. Uh, but I'm excited to think about how advising might play a role. And some ideas that I've, that I've heard are creating a dedicated pre-major advising office mm -hmm. for the 54% of LNS students who are undeclared. And that could be a way of honing in services for that population to help them find their home, explore and find their home. Um, intimate emeriti-led mentoring mm -hmm. communities or groups. Uh, possible smaller advising communities by field. So that might be like a physical sciences, neighborhood or community, uh, arts and humanities. And then another idea is, is neighborhoods, to use your term, that coalesce around students' needs. And it might be bringing together different student services um, professionals from around campus. So it could be their college advisor and their major advisor and maybe their DSP advisor. So how do we create those smaller and more intimate neighborhoods for students? Yeah, that's a great question. And I often liken different kinds of colleges and universities to different kinds of communities. There are places like Smith that are small towns and pretty much everybody knows everybody else. There's like one degree of separation between any two people on that campus at the most two. And then there are places like Berkeley. Berkeley is like New York City. There's work that was done by a faculty member some time ago, Troy Duster. I don't know if any of you have, um, you know, know Troy's work. 
But he was really interested in the sense of community at Berkeley. And he says that students look for their neighborhoods. And if you don't provide academic neighborhoods for them, they find social neighborhoods, their fraternities, their sororities, their athletic team. And we don't do enough, I believe, in trying to create those academic neighborhoods. One of the th programs that's been extremely successful has been Berkeley Connect. You probably know about Berkeley Connect. I've been wondering whether we can use Berkeley Connect more um, effectively for advising. But perhaps we can use the Berkeley uh, Freshman Seminar Program more effectively for advising. If you take a community that's already somewhat formed and then bring into it some um, conversation about advising questions, that's often a good place to start because you not only provide in a fairly efficient way input for the students, you also are enabling the students to create a community um, in which they can be resources for one another. Your idea was really fascinating to me about um, pre-major advising. We actually, at when I was at Smith, we changed the name of pre-major advising. And I want to explain why we did that. It seemed to many of the faculty there that pre-major advising made it seem like it was all just incidental on your path to a major. And our faculty felt very strongly you know, what you do outside of your major is at least 50% of the units that you take. And they wanted this to have more presence. And so what they called it was liberal arts advising. And, um, and spent a lot of time thinking about what are the um, capacities that they wanted students to develop in the work that was outside of their major. And so I hope if you use this letters and science idea, which I think is good, you don't call it pre-major advising, mm -hmm. that you call it um, liberal arts advising or letters and science advising or something that is, um, suggests that it's a destination, not just a, a, you know, a corridor on your way someplace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think from, from UQ's data, that I was interested to find out that students who are declared actually have a much greater sense of belonging. And yes. I think it's because they find that, that academic home for themselves. That's exactly right. And I think we can do some of that, again, by some of the structures that are already in place, Berkeley Connect, freshman seminars, mm -hmm. we can begin creating that academic home. There's some um, colleges and universities that have experimented with using freshman seminars, which they require of all students as the place where advising happens. Well, I'm excited and maybe we can continue these conversations about how, how that might happen. Um, and actually, I do have one follow-up question about that. Mm -hmm. the, in your idea of the neighborhoods, are they geographic or how, like, can you say a little bit more about your? I, I, th I, I think they can be um, uh, geographic, or they probably can be even virtual. But mm -hmm. um, a geographic probably makes the most sense. So you, you know, you see people, you mm -hmm. talk to them. Um, but uh, but uh, it, they can also be defined by interest. Um, but so mm -hmm. that's. Mm -hmm. I think there are lots of opportunities. My sense is the. Um, smaller colleges are more successful at doing this, chemistry, engineering, mm -hmm. um, uh, CED, CNR, mm -hmm. than, are, than the very the behemoth of, of letters and science. Yeah, the sheer numbers are just so challenging to figure yes. out how to create that intimate experience. Yes, that's right. Yeah, I worked in LNS for 16 years, so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I know that experience very much. Uh, so this is, this is actually uh, the question that this next question has the most um, of a preface from me, yeah. and I think that is, I think it deserves that actually. And that's a question about the increasingly challenging experience of incoming underrepresented students. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give a little bit of context and then ask about what we might do to create the kind of student experience that's envisioned in the strategic plan. Mm -hmm. And just for those of you who haven't seen it, there's a statement in the strategic plan that's circulating that proposes that Berkeley would be as renowned for its student experience as it is for its research achievements. So that's the part of the vision. And I was thinking as I was talking with folks in advance of this time um, the, about the factors that play a role in the student's transition to Cal and three things, there are many factors, but three things in particular came up. 
One, the climate for underrepresented students, and I think it's very well documented that historically underrepresented minority students, especially African Americans, report feeling much less welcome and respected at Berkeley compared to their non-URM peers. The second factor seems to be structural is issues and institutional barriers. So if you think about all the changes that have been coming in the last few years pretty rapidly, growing enrollment, this new pressing cancellation for non-payment deadline, increasing focus on time to degree, partly driven by the enrollment situation, earlier drop ad deadlines, financial aid disbursement issues, it's a long list. Full courses on the first day of new student enrollment last summer, hopefully that's not gonna happen, we, at least we know in advance now. Um, educational costs are rising, and then you add in things like looking for affordable housing and childcare, and all these transitions, emotions, stress are all happening at the same time that the, Ber <laughs> that the student is beginning their Berkeley experience. And then third is availability of support. So in spite of Herculean efforts by EOP and CE3 and faculty and staff across campus, still advisor availability is limited, enrollment managers are overworked, opportunities to meet with new students during the summer are fewer. So I spoke with EOP Assistant Director Yuki Burton and she, she, she asked what does this mean for our high potential first generation students, many of whom already have fear and anxiety about coming to Cal. And as she put it, these multiple factors can call, cause a snowball of disaster <laughs> during the student's first week of college, which doesn't set them up for success. And so are we losing opportunities for connection at the same time our expectations of students are rising? And so the question is, um, given all of these challenges that are increasing for our most marginalized students, what can we as a community do? And what role can advisors play in creating this environment that's envisioned by the strategic plan? Um, first of all, I want to uh, quote a statistic, which was really uh, was in some of the background that I had for this event. Um, I was really shocked. I, mean, I guess I knew it, but I was shocked to read it again. Our um, percentage of underrepresented students is half now what it was before SP1 and SP2 and Proposition 209, and that's a terrible loss for us. Um, there is, um, I had a really interesting conversation with the officers of the Haas um, uh, Junior um, Family Foundation the other day, and I, I, we have to develop a plan to increase the diversity of our student body that emphasizes not only our uh, recruitment and yield activities, but also the support that students get when they're here. Our underrepresented students graduate at 20, percent, uh, 20 percentage points less than our majority students. That's not acceptable to me. And this is not rocket science. We know what works with students, and it's this kind of, of um, supportive mentorship, advising structures, and so I, we have to challenge ourselves to just create better um, uh, 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 better resources for um, actually all students, but particularly our underrepresented students. So they have what, what I've um, been talking a lot lately about has been equity of experience. I've been increasingly troubled that our students who come here don't have an equity of educational experience that if you come from a family of relative uh, economic advantage, you have lots of college-going experience in your family, you have a much easier time navigating this enormously complex institution than if you come from a family has fewer economic resources and also fewer, uh, just less experience with college. There's a really interesting book by a woman named Laura Hamilton. It's called Parenting to a Degree. And it is a study of a big Midwestern university. And it's about the role of parents in student success. And you all know, just as well as I do, about helicopter parents. In fact, we used to talk at Smith about Black Hawk parents. <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, but um, this book shows, with this wonderful sociological research, how important parent engagement and advice can be for students. 
And this isn't saying anything about, you know, parents' love for their uh, child or their uh, desire to help. It's just that if you have greater sophistication in your family about higher education, you can in part substitute for the inadequate access to advising resources that many of our students have. So I, I, I think this is a challenge we have to take on as a campus. I don't think that we can be true to our mission and not do a better job with the kinds of um, advising and support structures for all of our students, but particularly for our underrepresented students than we, uh, than we have now. Mm -hmm. And I, I think also I was really surprised to hear there, there's, there was some data that compared underrepresented mi minority and women's experience when they first start. So in the survey of new students and then UQs at the end of their first year. And there was actually a decline in the sense of belonging for um, the UREM students and women during the first year. And I know that much of that seems to have to do with their experience with other students. And so that, that is a challenge too, to figure out how to make a difference with student behavior. Yeah. And I do a lot of fireside chats. Steve Sutton goes to these two and um, for various groups of students. And it was so striking to me. It was a theme in virtually every fireside chat we had um, this year is students, mostly juniors and seniors, talking about how long it took them, often until there were juniors and seniors, to navigate this campus. And for me, I've started um, developing a metaphor for it in the fact that, you know, if you don't know your way around here, it is very hard to find anything because we have no road markings anyplace. There's no sign that says this is Campanile Way or this is, you know, we don't even have names for the main thoroughfares through campus. And so, um, and I think that the campus in a more metaphorical way is also like that. We don't do a great job um, providing navigation aids for our students. And it's something that we just need to get better at than we, than we currently are. Thank you. Yeah, these students would often say, by the time I was a junior, the time I was a senior, I found out the campus has all these fabulous resources, but it took me two years or three years to find them. Yes. And that, that shouldn't be the case. Yes, we do a senior exit survey and students are like, I didn't know there was a counselor in Worcester Hall. You know, there's yeah. things they just, even in a small college, it's still, I think, challenging to find out about everything. Yeah, and it, it's so funny because I'm sure many of you in this room have kids. And it's so tempting as a parent to say, I told you that once. <laughs> <laughs> and you just have to, you know, it was in your packet. <laughs> we told you there was a counselor yes, in Worcester right. Hall. <laughs> And you just have to say things over and over yes. and over again. <laughs> and then, you know, it starts to, the multiple, me, multiple media and mm -hmm. students, I've learned much to my disappointment, do not read email. <laughs> mm -hmm. They don't, they do yeah. not anymore. So, um, so this is my last question actually. Um, and at an interview last spring that you had at the alumni house, uh, you were asked a question about how we can really engage our donors and what gets our donors excited. And you said that we need to be having conversations with them about what they, um, what, who they are, who they wanna be on this earth, what they want their legacy to be. Mm -hmm. So if I may, I would like to turn that question to you and ask you, who do you want to be on this earth and what would you like your, your legacy to be? Well, I think what, one of the most important things that I want my legacy to be is a better experience for our undergraduates. I mean, you all know that I, um, uh, housing is a very important piece of this. I wanna double our housing capacity in, um, in the next decade. But I think we can, we have the resources here to make this a friendly and more legible place for our undergraduates. And we just, we need to do it. We need to do it in part. This is such, it's, again, I'll go back to my metaphor of the city. This is such a big place and it's so easy to just stay in your little silo and you, you know, go from your little apartment into your dry cleaner and your grocery store and you go back up without ever trying to figure out how the whole map can be more legible. And that's one of the things I think we really have to do um, to our students. Yes, we're an under-resourced campus, but 
we're also not making as much of the resources that we have as we could. Mm -hmm. And so that's really important uh, to me. I want um, students not to say, you know, you, you, when you ride on some, some very scary ride in an amusement park, as I survived the, I don't know, whatever, <laughs> tornado or something like this. I don't want students to say, I survived Berkeley. I want students to say, I thrived at Berkeley. Mm -hmm. It was a great place for me. <coughs> Sorry. Yes. Thank you. That, I just feel that's so heartening, and I imagine it's heartening for our audience to hear, too, your, your commitment and a dedication to the student experience. And we, we now are at the time when we're going to transition. So thank you so much, Chancellor. And we're grateful to have this time. And we, um, Omar and Nancy have microphones. And um, we're going to ch change now to the Q&A part. And if you could possibly keep your questions to about a minute or so so that we can get to as many as possible, that would be great. We have one in the front here. OK. Thank you for having this conversation with us, Chancellor Chris. We greatly appreciate you addressing issues and advising. One of the things you spoke about early on is something that we in LNS Advising um, strongly support, and that is allowing technology to help us with the transactional items. Currently, we hear frequently that improvements in the technology is a two-year wait down the road because it's so under-resourced. The programming is so under-resourced, which is a big issue, and so we're constantly spending our time either doing it ourselves or finding workarounds or purchasing appointment scheduling systems outside of Cal Central, um, which takes a lot of time. I wonder if there's some kind of plan to actually fund technology so that it can do the jobs that allow us to spend more time with students, helping them navigate the pathways to their academic education. Uh, we uh, are in the middle of conversations right now about what kind of investments in CIS are important to make it um, uh, not only more functional, but more quickly functional than it currently is. I you know, beg people not to create their homegrown systems, but really to um, uh, keep up the pressure on us to make the investments in our central systems that will be good. Because if you, you create your homegrown system, then it, and then it just means it doesn't talk to the other systems, and that's not great. Thank you very much. I appreciate the conversation that we've had. Um, my quick background, I'm actually a undergrad alum um, from many, many moons ago and now literally finishing up my um, doctorate dissertation here in the School of Public Health. Um, so my research is actually a qualitative study to better understand the pre-med experiences of underrepresented minority students uh -huh. in the UC system. And one of the major findings has been this issue of um, advising and what a challenge and a barrier that it is for so many students mm -hmm. um, and unfortunately has been detrimental to their experience. Um, either through direct experiences that they've had or mm -hmm. another um, number of students who, because of their peers' experiences, actually just eschew advising altogether. Mm -hmm. And so I think my question is, um, what are we doing or what are some of the considerations that we have around training for advising, um, particularly for disadvantaged and underrepresented students? And in my thought process, um, really interactive training, because I, I often liken it to the health model where, you know, they're moving now towards patient-centered um, mm -hmm care, and so I'm thinking of student-centered, holistic care for advising, because one of the major complaints is that students come in and say they meet with the advisor, the advisor looks at their transcript for 30 seconds and mm -hmm. say, oh, you'll never be a doctor, figure out something else to do, without really asking what's really going on with them. So how yeah. can we sort of take some of the experiences and hearing directly from the students and translating those into trainings and sessions that we we can use to really equip advisors um, yeah. and better these interactions? That's a really great question. And I think probably some people in this room will have a better answer than I have to it. But let me just uh, give it a try. I think it's often easier for students to have those conversations in groups 
than it is individually. Um, sometimes advisors are not skilled and don't know what to ask for or what to look for, but sometimes the students just feel enormously self-conscious and shy and um, embarrassed to ask the questions that they need to ask. Whereas if you have a group of, say, eight to 10 students, and you, um, and you say they're all students who aspire to be doctors, um, uh, they're, they're pre-med, and you say to them, what are the questions you have? What do you need from your advisor? How can you help me? Um, that that's probably going to be a more helpful session individually for those students than 10 one-on-one -on -one sessions. It's probably also going to take less time. Hi, afternoon, and once again, thank you for your time, Carol. I know it's important. I also want to thank all of my colleagues here today who made time to be here because even though there's less students on campus, it's still busy in a multitude of other ways with GBA. So I appreciate everyone who got to be here and whose supervisor gave them time to be here. One of the things that I thought was so interesting, Susan, with your earlier questions was that we're the largest classification on campus with over 900 um, staff, which I think is crazy. I had no idea about that. But it often feels that many times advising when it comes to senior leadership and decisions, our voices are the last to be heard or they're not heard at all. So my question is strategically, what advice would you have for this category of employees moving forward to really make our voices be heard with concerns we have, whether it be strategic, um, on a direct services level, or just any way in general so that our concerns can really be heard by senior leadership? Um, I, I think you should organize um, that um, it would be really um, good, I think, to have a representative group of advisors who could be a thought partner with um, those parts of the administration that are thinking hard about advising. So um, that, that's my best idea. It's always harder when you have many individuals and many different kinds of jobs to have a collective voice I meet with lots of groups of various you know, staff employees. Some are um, uh, uh, defined by group identity, like uh, uh, the Black Staff Association, or there's a Native American group. There, uh, there's a, um, uh, a Ch Chicanx Latinx group. But I, I also think it would be really useful to have some advisory groups by job categories, particularly job categories that are really very critical to um, uh, the strategic plan and the goals that we have for the campus. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, this is more like two short observations that I think can uh, provoke some comment. Um, the first is about the, the, comp the increase in transactionality as part of it. Obviously, that's a sign on one level that it's just harder to get from arrival as a student on campus to graduation. You need more support in doing such. So I'm interested in how when I read the strategic plan and I see basically two main insights around the future of undergraduate education. One, that there'd be more fluidity to move across academic units and the th three plus one and the four plus two, those various ideas that are advanced. So it's interesting to me to think about, uh, the other I'll, I'll say is the discovery experience. So how those two sort of future directions for undergraduate education can be planned in a way that reduces complexity from arrival to graduation is interesting because that's going to help reduce transactionality. The second observation is just um, going back to this comment, Susan, of again in the strategic plan that, that we be as well known for student experience as research. And I, I just... I know some of you know in this room I'm an evangelist for the discovery effort, but my, my, what I want to say about this to this conversation is I think part of what's powerful about it is that it links those two, that it essentially is an effort to um, open up the, the power of the research enterprise to the undergraduate experience. 
And part of that opening is going to come through a new kind of messaging to our students. Because when they arrive, they don't come here necessarily with that kind of dichotomy on their mind. I mean, I, I just don't see that much that they're coming with even that much of a sense of the research enterprise at all. Um, so uh, I just think I'll conclude by saying I think that um, it's just going to be really promising to uh, try and solve so many of the problems we've addressed today about transactionality, about you know, belonging, things like that, through the new initiatives that are foregrounded in the strategic plan. That's a really, really interesting and, and, and provocative comment. Um, I would start with the transactionality with some analysis of what the transactionality is to see whether any of it can be eliminated or simplified. And I'll give a funny kind of analogy. I get a signature file like this you know, every day. And sometimes I'm signing off on um, a, a, a cup of coffee at Starbucks that one of my direct reports had. And I thought, is this really the best use of my time? I mean, sometimes I think we are so risk averse as a campus that we intensify the necessary transactionality. So I, I couldn't agree more. I think we would need to simplify rather than make things more complex. And it's my goal in terms of the student experience that every student have an experience here at Berkeley. That's because they went to Berkeley. That's really something specific to the character of this extraordinary campus. And one of the easiest um, ways in which we conceptualize that is discovery experiences. But there are other ones, too. Um, study abroad, um, uh, the, the internships, um, practicums, uh, um, uh, service learning that I think are transformative um, to students. I mean, what do you want for a student when he or she leaves? It's not that they can pass an exam on a bunch of content. I mean, you do hope that they absorb some content, but that's mostly <laughs> not what it is. It's really a sense of they've learned how to learn, that they have learned belief in their own capabilities, they've learned empathy. I mean, it, and, and I think it's so important. It, one of the things I think we've lost, because faculty are less involved in advising than they used to be, is that students tend to get a kind of anxiety about their education that it's all about just mastering the content of various courses. And when you step back, that's not really, in my view at least, what it's all about. It's really how they become the adult capable person that we know they're they, we all wish for them. I think we probably need to wrap up, yeah, right? I guess that's right. But so. thank you so much for all your good questions. I really look forward to being partners with you as we think hard about these questions. I know in the front row there are all these people that are thinking hard about these questions. Mm -hmm. Kathy Koshlin, Bob Jacobson, Steve Sutton. And so I want to thank you again for all the work you do. It's so important to our students. So thank you. Thank you. And I just want to add, I don't know if this person is in the audience, but we want to say a special thank you to the, to the person in integrative biology who proposed this meeting with the chancellor. So I don't know if you're here, but thank you. <laughs> and then also, also to Jenny and Danielle, Carol, and Cindy for helping make this event happen. And thank you so much, so much Chancellor. Really you. a pleasure, and I look forward to thank continued. You. Thanks for